more you can cultivate that sense of wealth, that sense of abundance in you, the more you can feel that sense of joy, the more easy it's going to be for you to do financially because you're not going to be in this scarce, fearful mode. Now, that's not enough by itself. You can have this great sense of abundance and do the wrong mechanics and be a disaster, true or false. But if I had a, they have an area to get you started with, you want to have the emotion and psychological strength because that's going to carry you through when the mechanics are boring or frustrating or when things aren't working out. Your emotion, your psychology is what will carry you. It will get you to keep doing it. Everyone knows, if you've done any studies, Dr. Seligman is very famous for doing studies on optimism. And in those studies, you know what he found out? People that are pessimists are much more realistic. They're much more accurate. If you give them a test and you ask them to look at something and give you a size measurement of it or to evaluate their own success or failure at a task, and every study Seligman's done, he did it in the University of I think, Pennsylvania, if I remember correctly, originally, what he found was that optimists always see themselves as doing better than they really did. They basically BS themselves. What happens to pessimists, they're ten times more accurate. But here's what he found out. What he found out is because the people who are accurate never push themselves because they know it's never going to work anyway. Whereas the optimist sees it better than it is, so they keep doing it. Because they have the illusion they did well, well, I'll do even better next time. And because of that optimism, they did it more often, and so optimists succeed at a four to five fold, depending upon the task, result ultimately beyond anything that a pessimist will do, and they're not as accurate. All that's a big way of saying is, if you can develop a psychology of resilience in yourself, you don't have to be optimistic or fake, you can be real. The realness is, whatever shows up, you are larger than anything that can happen to you. You are larger than any financial challenge you could ever face. Initially, we'll say, well, look at their houses, look at their homes, and they don't really have electricity, they don't have this, but they don't feel poor. It's your identity, the way you define the wealth, determines whether you're wealthy or not. So are there enough things for you, knowing that two-thirds of the planet lives on $2 a day, that you could get yourself to really feel grateful, yes or no? How much of your life do you get benefits from today that you never had to create? Think about it. Like I said, the road you ride on, the library, the books you didn't have to write, right? the internet that you can access in seconds and get answers to just about anything, the people in your life that you didn't have to raise but are there for you. Think about all the different aspects of your life. If you want to be wealthy, all you have to do is associate. So before we do the financial part, because financial independence is different than wealth. Wealth is that state of mind. Financial independence is being in that position where you don't ever have to work again. That if you work, you do it because you really want to. Now, I'll give you a clue. If you get financially independent and you don't work, you'll be miserable. I can't tell you how many friends I have that sold their company, made $50 million. One man made almost a billion dollars and was really excited for a while. But after a while, I was like bored. His vehicle of his business gave him a sense of contribution and he was always growing, figuring out how to solve problems. And he had all the people he was connected to in the business, all the employees and friends and associates. So I want to tell you, I'm not just saying this as some little positive thinking technique. I'm telling you, this is the secret, the real secret, to shift it inside of you and to add the real value. Most people are trying to pursue something in the future that they already have. I want you to think of what it is you think you want that will make you wealthy or financially free. By defining the game in a winnable way, a certain amount of money that we meet and that covers what we're going to call financial security, which might be your housing, your cars, your food, and basic entertainment. How many would feel rich if you didn't have to work, if your investments alone, the income from your investments, the income, covered those four items, your housing for the rest of your life, your food, right, your travel, and some entertainment. How many think that would feel pretty good? Say, I. And by the way, that number is way smaller than what most of you think of when you think about being financially independent, which is everything covered without working. So why not get the first one down, Pat? And you're going to know exactly what that number is for you and what it's going to take for that number where you don't have to work to meet it. Then we can look at financial independence where you don't have to work and everything is covered. Then we go to financial freedom. You don't have to work and everything you can think of is covered. (laughs) anything you ever want to do for yourself or others, those you want to give. That's a different level, isn't it? And most people think of financial freedom, they come up with this gigantic number that if you even figured out everything you want, it's nowhere near as big as you think. And because it's so big, you never even start the journey. 
and you don't think it's going to happen. So you talk about it, you hope you'll get some big hit sometime with your business or something, but you never get going. How many follow this? Say I. If you are significant in other people's eyes, what will that do for you? Well, you know, it was in my eyes, somebody that I would look, somebody that, but when you know, you get, an example. But, but when you get there, you won't look to yourself anymore. When you get there, you'll just be at a different level, and then you'll be trying to figure some other level of what you need to get to so you would respect yourself. That's a good point. <laughs> he always makes good points. You notice that? <laughs> so what you're doing is, here's the game you're playing, and I want all of you to hear this. No amount of money will ever make you wealthy. Because as soon as you get there, you will raise the game. Now here's what's great about that, to continue growing in all areas of life. If you could grow emotionally, should you? Yes or no? Yes. If you could give more, should you? Yes or no? Yes. If you grow intellectually, should you? Yes. If you could give more love, should you? Yes. If you could grow more financially, should you? Yes. yes, because growth is life. But having to grow in order to feel significant enough means you will always be poor. It's a game that never ends. Let's talk about money now, not wealth. What does it take mechanically to get this thing called financial independence? And what is financial independence as opposed to wealth? Wealth is a product of the mind. Again, no amount of money you ever achieve will make you wealthy. Financial independence means you never have to work again in order to live your life. That when you do work, you're doing it because you really want to, not because you have to. And how many are committed to not only being wealthy, but also financially independent? Say, ah! How do we get there? Let me give you the lesson how to get there. It is so simple that when I tell you, you're gonna go, oh, thank you for the breakthrough thought. <laughs> but even though you may know this intellectually, whether you're sophisticated or not, you probably know this. The formula for financial independence is so simple. And you can't achieve financial abundance unless you really learn to apply this, not just in a concept in your head, but consistently in your life. And that formula is simple. Spend less than you what? You go, thank you for the breakthrough thought, Tony. But is this what most people do, yes or no? Yes. No, what do most people spend? More. More than they earn. There's no way around this. No matter how much money you have, if you spend more than you earn, you got a challenge. So there's no way to be financially free, financially independent without spending less than you earn, and what do you gotta do with what you don't spend? Yes. You gotta invest the difference. Because what I wanna show you right now is how do you build what everybody should own. Every one of you should leave here with your own personal money machine. You want to create a money machine, a machine that while you're sleeping is making you money, right? So you're no longer trading the most valuable resource you have in life, your time for money. You want to trade money for money. You want money to go to work. You want to put that money to work for you so while you're sleeping it's making a difference. You want to create a machine, and that machine you want to create is something that you want to be able to feed you at some stage where you don't have to work. That's what the money machine is. The second secret to this is you got to reinvest. How many of you have ever made a big hit in your investments and went, oh my God, that's so cool, and took the money and spent it on something? Raise your hand, say I. Come on, say I. I know you all, anybody who's invested has done this. If you got a big hit, you go, oh, this is it. Nothing wrong with that, but you gotta make sure a significant amount that you reinvest your returns so you get compounded what? Compounded growth is the most basic principle in the world. We all know it intellectually. But are you emotionally associated enough that you're really utilizing it to its maximum capability? If you don't, you're not going to get financially free. You will never get financially independent by your earnings alone. Every one of you in this room is going to lose money. Every one of you. There's no way. The person I work with, one of the top financial traders in the history of the world, top 10 in the history of the world, is not even right half the time. How could you make billions of dollars if you're not even right half the time? Not even 51% of the time. I'm going to show you in a few moments. It's known as asset allocation. It's the way you invest. It's what you do. That's what's going to shift this. So first step, spend less than you earn, invest the difference. Second step, reinvest it so you get compounded growth until you reach the home run, your money machine, until you reach a critical mass, a critical mass of capital, of investment capital. When you get to that critical mass, and what determines the critical mass is how much you need for the lifestyle that you want, once you get that critical mass, what it provides for you is what you're investing for. Who knows, no matter what investment you're doing, what are you really investing for? Whether you're investing in cars, stocks, bonds, real estate, financial instruments, what are you investing for? You're not, for, you're not investing for returns. That illusion will keep you from getting to the end game. 
If you're wealthy, here's what makes you wealthy. Income, not assets. Assets you can buy, and assets change in value all the time. You need income. This is the only reason to invest. You invest for one reason, so you have an income for life without working. And to do that, you've got to build a critical mass of capital that the interest on it alone will give you that income, and you can have the life you want without working. And the only way to do that is do those first two steps. Spend less than you earn, invest it, reinvest it till you hit that critical mass. Now, how to do that is actually a lot simpler than you think. We make things more complex than it really is. You've got to think of this as your target. In order to achieve what you want, where you have a money machine, here's what you must do. You must pick out a minimum financial goal for yourself. Even to achieve your minimum financial goal, you've got to pick out a specific amount of money that you're going to invest every month, every year, no matter what. A specific percentage of your income. If you don't do that, forget the rest of this course. It's a waste of your time. Because you're going to make a bunch of money, but you won't be practicing the fundamentals, and eventually you'll make a mistake and you'll lose it. Let me tell you another secret to life. If you do the right thing at the wrong time, you get pain. If you plant in the winter, I don't care how hard you work. I don't care if you work day and night and you work to the bone and you plant your seeds in the middle of the winter. What's going to happen when fall comes? Are you going to be rewarded, yes or no? No. So if you don't understand that the seasons are changing, you're in trouble. What is asset allocation? It means out of the money you have to invest, we're going to create three buckets. Really simple way of thinking of this from now on. The first bucket is the security bucket. When you think about investing, think of two types of investments. There are fixed income investments, and most of you are clear what this means. What does it mean when it's a fixed income investment? Who knows? What does that mean? You've got a guaranteed rate of return, assuming they deliver. And anyone cannot deliver, including the U.S. government. They haven't not delivered, but they could. Is there risk in any investment, yes or no? So just ratios of risk. And as we know, you know, no risk, no, no reward. So if you don't invest, you're going to lose if you invest the times. But if you don't invest, you've already lost and you can never win, never have a money machine, never be financially free. The second type of investment that you can make and it helps you understand what you're going to do is something that's going to be growth driven. And growth investments are investments where you probably have a much greater potential for growth, which means you get a greater return if you're successful. But if you're not successful, do you have a guaranteed rate of return, yes or no? No, so in a growth investment, you have the potential of greater return, but also greater, greater loss. The security bucket is where you want to put investments that are secure by their nature. Because they're secure, is this going to give you a huge compounded return per year, yes or no? But can it give you a huge compound return, even if the number is small, if you do it long enough, yes or no? Yes. So what we want to do is your first investments have to be in your security bucket, and everybody wants to do the opposite. Okay. The question then becomes, what percentage you put in your security bucket, what goes in there? Well, here's some things that go in there. If you don't have at least two to six months worth of cash that covers your overhead, you're in deep trouble. The first step to getting financially secure, not financially independent, is to make sure you got enough cash so if something happens, you can go for six months. You got the freedom. What else might you put in there? Types of investments. An IRA goes in here, right? Pretty secure. Insurance. The insurance is protecting you. That's part of security. What else could go in there? Your home. Don't think of your home as an investment. Because for most of you, you're eventually not going to sell that home and eat it. You're not going to sell your home and get income off it. Now, some of you may be. You made a stage of life where you're accumulating the same homes, and eventually you're going to sell and buy a smaller home and take that critical mass that came from selling the big home, and it's going to take care of you for life. If you're doing that, great. But the place to think about your home in terms of leverage, put it in your security bucket. How many agree with me on this, by the way? Say I. Because, by the way, if you don't have a home, you're going to be really stressed out. Right? So I've got to think of my growth outside my home, really. Think of your compound interest outside your home. Your home may be a bonus for you. And fixed income investments all fit in this category. Now, what's the second bucket? The second bucket is growth. Two ways you're going to learn about growth. The buy and hold strategy, which is the strategy of an owner. And by the way, that buying and holding, that is less risky to some extent than momentum because of the timing. But it can be just as risky. What is momentum trading? That's when you're no longer an owner, you're a trader. A financial trader, everybody's a financial trader. Most of you are trading time for your money. Here you're trading money for money. Here, what you're looking at is you're seeing movement in prices. And what a momentum player is doing is they're playing for the short term, usually. Third bucket is the dream bucket. The dream bucket is you want to travel around the world. The dream bucket is 
you, depending upon the size of how you think or what you're doing or your economics, you want to own a condominium in Aspen. It might be the boat. It might be a trip. It might be owning a basketball team, owning an island. It depends on the size of what it is you want to do. And by the way, bigger isn't better. The more you have to have to feel financially free, the more stress you're going to have. How many follow this? It's the opposite of what you think. The more you have, the more you've got to manage, the more time, the more energy, the more risk, the more capital. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Some of you are very, very driven to create and risk. That's a personality type. We know it's crazy. <laughs> I happen to be one of those types to some extent. But even a crazy person's got to make sure their security's there or their craziness at one point will bite them. How many follow? If you can get financially free for less, do it. Be wealthy now and get financially free quicker. And then walk in, you won. And then keep that stuff in your security bucket. And if you want to play a bigger game now, you've already won. And everything you're playing now, that's where the house is money. You can go for something bigger. And if, you, if it doesn't work out, you're still handled. Your security, what you're here for is totally free. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Say I. that sense of wealth, that sense of abundance in you, the more you can feel that sense of joy, the more easy it's going to be for you to do financially. Because you're not going to be in this scarce, fearful mode. Now, that's not enough by itself. You can have this great sense of abundance and do the wrong mechanics and be a disaster. True or false? But if I had to have an area to get you started with, you want to have the emotion and psychological strength because that's going to carry you through when the mechanics are boring or frustrating or when things aren't working out, your emotion, your psychology is what will carry you. It will get you to keep doing it. Everyone knows if you've done any studies, Dr. Seligman is very famous for doing studies on optimism. And in those studies, you know what he found out? People that are pessimists are much more realistic. They're much more accurate. If you give them a test and you ask them to look at something and give you a size measurement of it or to evaluate their own success or failure at a task, and every study Seligman's done, he did it in the University of, I think, Pennsylvania, if I remember correctly, originally. What he found was that optimists always see themselves as doing better than they really did. They basically BS themselves. What happens to pessimists, they're ten times more accurate. But here's what he found out. What he found out is because the people who are accurate never push themselves because they know it's never going to work anyway. Whereas the optimist sees it better than it is, so they keep doing it. Because they have the illusion they did well, well, I'll do even better next time. And because of that optimism, they did it more often. And so optimists succeed at a four to five fold, depending upon the task, result ultimately beyond anything that a pessimist will do. And they're not as accurate. All that's a big way of saying is if you can develop a psychology of resilience in yourself, you don't have to be optimistic or fake. You can be real. The realness is whatever shows up, you are larger than anything that can happen to you. You are larger than any financial challenge you could ever face. Initially, we'll say, well, look at their houses, look at their homes, and they don't really have electricity, they don't have this, but they don't feel poor. It's your identity, the way you define the wealth determines whether you're wealthy or not. So are there enough things for you, knowing that two-thirds of the planet lives on $2 a day, that you could get yourself to really feel grateful, yes or no? Yes. How much of your life do you get benefits from today that you never had to create? Think about it. Like I said, the roads you ride on, the library, the books you didn't have to write, right? the internet that you can access in seconds and get answers to just about anything, the people in your life that you didn't have to raise but are there for you. Think about all the different aspects of your life. If you want to be wealthy, all you have to do is associate. So before we do the financial part, because financial independence is different than wealth. Wealth is that state of mind. Financial independence is being in that position where you don't ever have to work again. That if you work, you do it because you really want to. Now, I'll give you a clue. If you get financially independent and you don't work, you'll be miserable. 
I can't tell you how many friends I have that sold their company, made $50 million, one man made almost a billion dollars. RPM planning is a way to maximize the results of your life and maximize your sense of fulfillment and joy. It's both. In order to do that, we got to change what we focus on from the question of what do I have to do to what's my outcome? What do I want? What's most important to me? What's the result I'm committed to getting? That one change will change completely how you respond in your life because it will change you from focusing where everyone's demanding your attention or what you're afraid of, or what might give you pleasure in the moment, to what's most important to you. And those, by the way, are the three things that get our focus. If we don't discipline ourselves, what gets our focus? Something we're afraid of, something that give us pain. What's the second thing that gets our focus? We don't pay attention. Something will give us pleasure. It's like, you know what, I'm so stressed out. Oh, that chocolate's looking good. Oh, that, you know, I'm going to go over to have my little coffee, you know, at my smoke and mocha doko cream, this thing and that thing, and I'm going to escape for a few moments. Because the focus is how to feel good. How to not feel bad, how to feel good. What's the third thing gets your focus? Other people's demands. Where do they come from today? Where do you get other people's demands? Only face-to-face? See, you used to have that one handle, right? Okay, well, I, I, I know they're coming down the elevator. I'll go over here. <laughs> you know, I know they're going to lunch at this time. I'll come back at that time. How many ever played this game at one time in your life where it's like, I don't want to deal with this right now, so you just put yourself in a different location to avoid the stimulus of someone else's demand? How many used to do that? Say I. Does it work anymore? No. They're instant messaging you. They're emailing you. Right? They're, they're, they're everywhere. Right? There's triggers in every way for this to occur. Pick up the phone and call you. And where's the phone now? In your pocket. And by the way, if you're not there, they left you a voicemail. You got another job answering your voicemail. Think about it. So today, it's pretty hard to avoid the demands. It's not necessarily there are more demands. It's just that we're accessible to more demands. And if you don't know what you want, and you don't know why it's a must for you to achieve it, and you don't have a plan, I can promise you something. You're going to fit in everybody else's plan. And you're going to wonder why you're stressed. And you're going to wonder why I'm not fulfilled. What is time? How do you know when it's a long time? Or how do you know when it's a short time? It's not because it's 10 minutes or 10 hours. How many have been in 10 hours and time flew because you loved what you're doing, didn't have any sense of time whatsoever? How many have had that experience? Say aye. aye. How many have had 10 minutes feel like 10 years you want to kill somebody to get out of the situation? <laughs> so what is time? Time is emotion. Got to remember that time is emotion. What you're really managing is emotion. Another word for that would be Meaning or fulfillment. Focus is power, but you got to take it. Take it back. Take back that power. And you got to know when you do that, that focus, how to chunk it, how to group it so you're not overwhelmed. Let me show you how to make it simpler. When mass information is coming at you, you get overwhelmed. Most of us are great deletion creatures. We delete most of life. Right now, there are millions of things around you you could be focusing on, thinking about, giving meanings to making decisions about what to do. Millions. Right now, you could be focusing on the blood rushing through your left eardrum or the feeling of your skin against your body, but most of you delete that. You don't even think about clothing against your skin until I mention it or your heartbeat. Most of the universe you've deleted because you go crazy if you try to think about it all because human beings have a limited amount they can focus on at one time. And most of your stress is because you're thinking about too many things at once. In fact... When people don't do things, it's not because they can't. It's not even because they don't want to. It's because of the way they are focusing on what I call chunking things. When people don't follow through, here's what they do. I'll give you an example. Who here believes exercise is very important, but you don't exercise regularly? Let me see a show of hands. Raise your hand. <laughs> More hands than most of us want to raise our hand, right? Now, who here really focuses, or I should say, exercises regularly? Raise your hand. Regularly. Okay, great. Who here does not exercise regularly, even though you believe it's important? Just be truthful. Okay, great. So let's see what the difference is here. A person who does not exercise regularly, I want you to raise your hand, and I want you to tell me why you don't exercise regularly. Be truthful. Okay? Yes, sir. I don't have the time. Now, is that true? <laughs> he even knows it's not true. He's going to answer you first. No. But it feels like he doesn't have the time because time is emotion and he's got so many other things he is focused on getting results in that adding this to the list seems like a lot 
right? And the other things are very important to him, like his business. I don't have the time. He has the time. What's the real reason he doesn't do it? Because of the way he thinks about exercise. When he focuses on what it would take to exercise, he does it very differently than someone who follows through. When you think about exercising, what's involved? Okay, he starts thinking about, I got to get to mile 14 of the London Marathon. And that, even the thought of trying to get to the 14th mile, much less the 25th mile, is like beyond my imagination right now. So he is what I call overchunked. He's not thinking about what he wants. He's thinking about what's painful. You just saw a perfect example. He's not even thinking about victory or succeeding. So the chance of him following through on something that he associates major pain to when he can do something else right now he can feel competent or successful at, his chances of following through are very limited. How many will follow that? Say I. His focus is on failure. His focus is on pain. That's why he isn't following through. Okay? He's also focused on the 14th mile of a marathon rather than today's workout. Which one seems more daunting to you? <laughs> so when you think of what it, and here's also what he's thinking about. He's thinking about the process, not the outcome or result he wants. And when you think about what it's going to take to do something, usually it takes a lot and you're not going to want to do it. So he's overchunked himself. He's trying to eat the whale whole without taking any smaller bites. And it seems too big for him, so he says, well, I'll do it when? Later, as my Australian friends would say, later, <laughs> right? And of course, the problem with doing it tomorrow is when you get to tomorrow, tomorrow is today, and tomorrow never comes. So, and you keep promising yourself. By the way, what does this do to you emotionally when you keep breaking your own promises with yourself? Or you keep failing to do things that you know are important? Does it increase your level of certainty and confidence? No. What it does is it erodes it. And when you erode confidence in one area, believe it or not, it affects the other areas too. Do you believe me on that? Don't believe me. What about your own life experience? Maybe not one area, but it starts to be multiple areas. It sure does. Another reason why somebody doesn't exercise or do anything is because they don't just chunk it too big. They chunk it in too many details. I'll give you a perfect example. So I asked somebody one time, I said, uh, okay, how important is exercise? Is? Oh, exercise is extremely important. Really? Okay, good. And Tell me, why don't you exercise regularly? Well, I, you know, I just don't have time. Okay, everybody gives that answer. That sounds wonderful. So tell me, though, don't tell me about how much time you don't have. Tell me this. When you think about exercising, what do you think about? Which is a way of saying, what do you focus on? And so this woman says to me, well, my gosh, you know, I, 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 mean, I, I mean, what do you mean what do I think about? Well, let's say I said to you, you've you got to start exercising, and I'm going to put a gun to the head of your children and I will do very horrible things and hurt them badly if you don't exercise. Could you do it? Oh, yeah, I could do it. You know, if, I, if, you, if some mafia person came here and said, I'm going to kill your children if you don't exercise every day, how many think you could find a way to exercise every day, no matter what your time constraints may be? So remember this. Remember this. Change is never a matter of ability. It's always a matter of motivation. I'll say that again. Change is never a matter of ability. It's always a matter of motivation or drive, having strong enough reasons. If you got a strong enough reason, you could figure out the time, couldn't you? So the biggest part of life and time management is knowing what you want and having enough reasons to follow through. RPM planning is a way to maximize the results of your life and maximize your sense of fulfillment and joy. It's both. In order to do that, we got to change what we focus on from the question of what do I have to do to what's my outcome? What do I want? What's most important to me? What's the result I'm committed to getting? That one change will change completely how you respond in your life because it will change you from focusing where everyone's demanding your attention or what you're afraid of or what might give you pleasure in the moment to what's most important to you. And those, by the way, are the three things that get our focus. If we don't discipline ourselves, what gets our focus? Something we're afraid of, something that give us pain. What's the second thing that gets our focus? We don't pay attention. Some will give us pleasure. It's like, you know what? I'm so stressed out. Oh, that chocolate's looking good. Oh, that, you know, I'm going to go over to have my little coffee, you know, at my smoke and mocha doko cream, this thing and that thing, and I'm going to escape for a few moments. Because the focus is how to feel good. How to not feel bad, how to feel good. What's the third thing that gets your focus? Other people's demands. 
Where do they come from today? Where do you get other people's demands? Only face to face? See, you used to have that one handle, right? Okay, well, I, I, I know they're coming down the elevator. I'll go over here. <laughs> you know, I know they're going to lunch at this time. I'll come back at that time. How many ever played this game at one time in your life where it's like, I don't want to deal with this right now, so you just put yourself in a different location to avoid the stimulus of someone else's demand? How many used to do that? Say I. Does it work anymore? No. They're instant messaging you. They're emailing you, right? They're, they're, they're everywhere. Right? There's triggers in every way for this to occur. Pick up the phone and call you, and where's the phone now? In your pocket. And by the way, if you're not there, they left you a voicemail. You got another job answering your voicemail. Think about it. So today, it's pretty hard to avoid the demands. It's not necessarily there are more demands. It's just that we're accessible to more demands. And if you don't know what you want, and you don't know why it's a must for you to achieve it, and you don't have a plan, I can promise you something. You're going to fit in everybody else's plan. And you're going to wonder why you're stressed. And you're going to wonder why I'm not fulfilled. What is time? How do you know when it's a long time? Or how do you know when it's a short time? It's not because it's 10 minutes or 10 hours. How many have been in 10 hours and time flew because you loved what you're doing, didn't have any sense of time whatsoever? How many have had that experience? Say aye. aye. How many have had 10 minutes feel like 10 years you want to kill somebody to get out of the situation? <laughs> so what is time? Time is emotion. Got to remember that time is emotion. What you're really managing is emotion. Another word for that would be meaning or fulfillment. Focus is power, but you got to take it. Take it back. Take back that power. And you got to know when you do that, that focus, how to chunk it, how to group it so you're not overwhelmed. Let me show you how to make it simpler. When mass information is coming at you, you get overwhelmed. Most of us are great deletion creatures. We delete most of life. Right now, there are millions of things around you you could be focusing on, thinking about, giving meanings to, making decisions about what to do. Millions. Right now, you could be focusing on the blood rushing through your left eardrum or the feeling of your skin against your body. But most of you delete that. You don't even think about clothing against your skin until I mention it or your heartbeat. Most of the universe you've deleted because you go crazy if you try to think about it all because human beings have a limited amount they can focus on at one time. And most of your stress is because you're thinking about too many things at once. In fact, when people don't do things, it's not because they can't. It's not even because they don't want to. It's because of the way they are focusing on what I call chunking things. When people don't follow through, here's what they do. I'll give you an example. Who here believes exercise is very important, but you don't exercise regularly? Let me see a show of hands. Raise your hand. <laughs> More hands than most of us want to raise our hand, right? Now, who here really focuses, or I should say, exercises regularly? Raise your hand. Regularly. Okay, great. Who here does not exercise regularly, even though you believe it's important? Just be truthful. Okay, great. So let's see what the difference is here. A person who does not exercise regularly, I want you to raise your hand, and I want you to tell me why you don't exercise regularly. Be truthful. Okay? Yes, sir. I don't have the time. Now, is that true? <laughs> he even knows it's not true. He's going to answer you first. No. But it feels like he doesn't have the time because time is emotion. And he's got so many other things he is focused on getting results in that adding this to the list seems like a lot, right? And the other things are very important to him, like his business. I don't have the time. He has the time. What's the real reason he doesn't do it? Because of the way he thinks about exercise. When he focuses on what it would take to exercise, he does it very differently than someone who follows through. When you think about exercising, what's involved? At the moment, about mile 14 of the Roman Marathon. Uh, That's why it's painful. So okay, he starts thinking about, i got to get to mile 14 of the London Marathon. And that, even the thought of trying to get to the 14th mile, much less the 25th mile, is like beyond my imagination right now. So he is what I call overchunked. He's not thinking about what he wants. He's thinking about what's painful. You just saw a perfect example. He's not even thinking about victory or succeeding. So the chance of him following through on something that he associates major pain to when he can do something else right now he can feel competent or successful at, his chances of following through are very limited. How many will follow that? Say I. His focus is on failure. His focus is on pain. That's why he isn't following through. Okay? He's also focused on the 14th mile of a marathon rather than today's workout. 
Which one seems more daunting to you? <laughs> so when you think of what, it, and here's also what he's thinking about. He's thinking about the process, not the outcome or result he wants. And when you think about what it's going to take to do something, usually it takes a lot and you're not going to want to do it. So he's overchunked himself. He's trying to eat the whale whole without taking any smaller bites. And it seems too big for him, so he says, well, I'll do it when? Later. later. As my Australian friends would say, later. <laughs> right? And of course, the problem with...